Well, fa Kate forgot to tell you that I'm also a bit of a media whore. <laughs> I get my name in the paper a lot. Part of it because, is because I throw out big numbers and people love to print big numbers. Um, what I want to talk about today is that people are your most important asset. They're your, they're your most expensive asset, but they're also your most valuable asset. They're so valuable that a 10 minute a week loss in productivity is the equivalent of a 25% reduction in their office space. So guess what? People that are healthier are more productive and happier. Isn't that amazing? You know, PhDs figured all that out. <laughs> so I think that's why the term well-being has finally, you know, come out of the HR circles and, and found its way into the C-suite. Uh, and found its way into office design. Uh, this is a picture of the new GSK building at the Philadelphia Navy Yard. It incorporates choice of space. Uh, wait, uh, John Campbell, would you like to stand up? <laughs> we could applaud him for that. <laughs> uh, Wayfinding that encourages activity. We heard yesterday somebody talking about just moving the trash can so people get get up and go to the trash can makes a big difference. Lots of that going on here in the building. A rooftop garden. Um, and other elements that are designed to really fuel an employee's mind, body, and spirit. So let me just make sure we're all on the same page in terms of wellness and well-being. By wellness, I mean you know, the physical us, the, all the bits are working properly. Uh, by well-being, it requires that all your phys physical bits are working. Um, but it, it, it's bigger. It goes to your mind and your, 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 how you think about things and stress and a lot of the things that we've been talking about here. And they really go hand in hand and you can't have one without the other. When I first started looking at this, it, it was really a natural evolution of this agile workplace. I mean, it, 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 it all goes together. What, what is it we're trying to do here? Are we trying to reduce office space? Well, maybe we are, but if we do it and we don't do it in the right way, it's going to be expensive in terms of people. So I think about the base of Maslow's hierarchy as those physiological things, the, the wellness things. So, you know, lighting and temperature and food and movement and all that kind of thing. Even if you think of uh, the, the noise and the privacy issue in terms of your safety factors, I think that all belongs at the bottom of the pyramid. And you can't move up to the pyramid you know, you're not going to be thinking about the, your belonging in the organization and the organization's mission and its contribution to society if you're looking for a sweater uh, because you're freezing and you're making physical ther therapy appointments because your back is killing you. Um, so you need this base in order to get to the higher levels. So why well-being and why, you know, why should the C-suite and, and, and uh, facilities people and design people be looking at this? Well, in the next 15 minutes, I want to answer that, and I'm also going to answer the other question that should be on any good executive's mind, what's in it for me? So first, let me talk about the people are expensive uh, slide. Um, I think it raised some eyebrows that 10 minutes a week. You know, how, how can that possibly be? So I'm going to do just a little bit of math here, uh, and if you're, if you're uh, math impaired, feel free to check your emails for the uh, next two slides. Okay, so I said that that employee who has, let's say they have a $10,000 a year office. Obviously, they're not in New York. Uh, we reduce that by 25%. Public math here, right? That's $2,500. Let's say that person's making about $70,000 a year, and the overhead on that is about 30%. So they're making about $100,000 a year. That's their, their all-in cost to us. You divide that out. Uh, somebody making $100,000 a year is making $50 an hour. $50 an hour times 50 weeks is, guess what, $2,500. So that hour of week offsets the office. But I said 10 minutes, didn't I? How does that work out? A person isn't hired into a, a, a company to just offset their salary. They're supposed to produce more than their salary or the company is not going to make any money. And so a, a typical metric, let's say, in the financial services industry is six times uh, salary. So an average person in the financial services sector is making six times their income. So that $100,000 person is now earning the company $600,000 a year. So divide that one hour by six and we have 10 minutes a week. That's less time than you spend in a week brushing your teeth. I mean. 
And, and what, was the, what was the number that we just heard of, of the potential loss? 20%? I can't even calculate the percentage of 10 minutes a week over a 50-week over a uh, year. So let's talk about the costs of wellness or the lack of wellness. When, when we typically talk about it, we're thinking about things like these direct costs, absenteeism, health care costs, disability, disability workers' comp. And so Towers Watson puts this number at about 15% of payroll. But presenteeism is a much bigger problem than absenteeism. Lots and lots and lots of studies to show this, lots of studies that have shown how much more, uh, anywhere from 5% uh, to 47% more than the impact of absenteeism. So it's a real multiple, multiple factor here. And the, uh, this isn't figured in. So if you if figure in presenteeism, um, and presenteeism actually has a different meaning in different countries, and I just learned this, so I, I, have, I have to say, you know, it's coming to work when you don't feel well and not performing your best. We've all had those days. Um, so uh, the, uh, I guess it was uh, Society for Human Resource Management puts this at about 36% of payroll. So that together with those direct costs comes up to 36% of payroll. But even that, we're really just talking about the tip of the iceberg. It doesn't include things like uh, delays in projects um, that, that might result from the um, uh, presenteeism and absenteeism and, and all of those things. Uh, it doesn't include um, things like reduced engagement and morale when you've got people that are just kind of down in the dumps and not really working. Um, it doesn't uh, increase overtime. Uh, a lot of companies that really have to have a certain number of people in place actually have to have extra people on staff just in case the, the, uh, the regular staff doesn't come in. So there's lots and lots of costs below the, uh, below the waterline, even safety. Uh, lots of studies have shown that even the day after we uh, go to daylight savings time, uh, workplace accidents go up. So just that one hour loss of sleep and that change in circadian rhythm can, make a, a, can increase your, your office safety or decrease your office safety. And by the way, when we go back to uh, regular time, the opposite thing happens. I mean, they show a one-for-one -one relationship. The good news is that wellness and well-being is largely a choice. And the, and the risk factors are very well known. So let's just talk about some of those risk factors, the risk factors for chronic disease. The low-hanging fruit here uh, is obesity in this order, uh, physical inactivity, stress, as we heard, poor food choices, and tobacco use. In terms of obesity, that's associated with diabetes, heart disease, some cancers, joint problems. Uh, it's by far the most costly risk factor of all of these for uh, a person's health and for the company's um, uh, health cost, wellness cost. CDC estimates that by if uh, the obesity problem c continues, by 2050, one in four people will have diabetes. Uh, right now, about a third of the population is obese, and another third of the population, and I say population, I mean workforce, is overweight. Physical, whoop, I went backwards. Physical inactivity uh, is the next one. Uh, we're becoming a nation of couch potatoes and chair potatoes. Uh, if you want to stand up while I'm talking, feel free to, because it's really good for you. Uh, we heard yesterday some statistics about too much sitting cuts off years of your life. Um, about half of the uh, U.S. population is not getting enough physical activity. In the corporate world, it's that sitting, uh, not moving. You know, so we're seeing the work stand desk, we're seeing relocating the copier, relocating the trash can, making the stairwell attractive. There's all kinds of things you can do to impact that. And then there's stress. Uh, we all know that stress isn't well, it, sometimes it is good for you. Sometimes, somewhere between a quarter and a half of the U.S. population says that, say that they find their workplace stressful. Um, some stress is good. It keeps us on the game. But chronic stress uh, is literally a killer. And, as, and in terms of workplace stress, the, the biggest is, issues are work-life conflict, not having the flexibility and control to deal with your personal life as well as your work life, work changes, the kinds of changes that we're all involved with, 
work relationships, those things like uh, uh, you hate the boss or you can't stand your coworker or whatever. Um, financial concerns, your own personal financial concerns. So we're back to that you know, whole person that brings themselves to work and ne needing to deal with them um, and not having control or influence over your work. A lot of, we keep hearing the word control, it, it, uh, it comes up. Uh, then we got four uh, poor uh, food choices. <laughs> this is a really lousy slide to put up right before lunch, and I'm, and I'm sorry, but it really makes me hungry. <laughs> uh, obviously, lead to weight problems, high cholesterol, uh, and so much more. Uh, something just as simple as changing the kind of food you serve in the cafeteria or in the snack machines or the snack room can have a big Im impact on employees' health. Smoking, um, as we all know, devastates not just your own health, but potentially other people's. Uh, I lost a brother at the ripe old age of 54 who never smoked, uh, but my father smoked three packs a day from the time he was 10. And talk about those little 10-minute chunks. How many 10-minute chunks do you lose in, in productivity from, from somebody that smokes? Depression is one that wasn't one of those top five factors, but it's the third uh, highest cost factor for a company behind um, obesity and uh, physical inactivity. Uh, and it's something that uh, companies that were just polled by World at Work, it, mental health is the first thing they said they would drop from their uh, wellness programs. Not a good idea. Okay, so here's some, some pretty amazing numbers. Uh, CDC uh, says that um, chronic disease accounts for 75% of all health healthcare claims, chronic conditions. 68% of the workforce so seven out of 10 of you has at least one uh, chronic condition. Towers, uh, sorry. Um, if you add obesity, which is considered now a disease, that number jumps to 86%. People who have at least one chronic condition, uh, I'm sorry, at least two chronic conditions, have three to 10 times more unhealthy days per month. And that doesn't include the, uh, the presenteeism and other you know, below the waterline risk factors. The pr problem with this is these risks tend to uh, snowball. If you've got one, you're gonna have two or three or four or five. And so if we just looked at uh, obesity alone, the cost is 27% higher, the, the health cost for that person is 27% higher than a nor uh, somebody that isn't obese. But if you add these other factors that often go along with obesity, we're up to 213% of the cost of a person that doesn't have those risk factors. So I mentioned engagement, um, or maybe I didn't men mention engagement, uh, as one of the things that are leading the, uh, the need to um, take on these programs. And it, we've all heard these statistics from uh, um, Gallup and others who say that engagement is really, really poor in society, or in, in the, in, uh, the office place. Uh, they've correlated, you know, what does the, the impact of wellness have on engagement, and it's, it's huge. Um, you know, it's, it's quality, it's safety, it's turnover, it's absenteeism, so it really, really has a big impact. Um, the, who was Gallup did another study that said that um, in terms of uh, lowest level of engagement, costs two and a half times what an employee with high engagement costs in terms of health care. And a 2012 study showed that 13, a study of 1,300 companies and 17 million employees in 45 countries, 52% of those companies said that their wellness program paid for itself uh, in one year, um, and others said in uh, three years. Only 11% of U.S. companies have what's considered to be a comprehensive wellness program. I mean, 90% have wellness programs, but they deal with just tobacco or just this or just that or just whatever. We've got to start treating the whole person. Um, the Delos model, I don't, I'm sure many of you have heard of uh, Delos. They're building well buildings, uh, and they've aligned with the Green Building Council to uh, actually include incorporate them into LEED certification. And they're dealing with all of these things that you can do within a building to make uh, people more healthy. Uh, couple that with all of these agile work factors, um, giving them choice, giving them places where they can feel safe, where they have their privacy need met, 
where they have their collaboration, where they ha can have a best friend at work. And all these things are going to lead to um, more productive, healthier, more engaged employees. Full disclosure here, we're working on a, a paper on the ROI of uh, wellness in the workplace with uh, Delos as a sponsor. But the reason we picked them as a sponsor is because they're just really on the leading edge, I think, of this whole model. They just built the first well-certified building, the CBR E building in uh, LA. So it's going to take some time before we know what the, what the results are there. So there's an awful lot that we know and an awful lot we don't know about what works and what doesn't work, both in the building. You know, are these new places productive? You know, where, how do you configure them for privacy and collaboration? And you know, all those kinds of questions are still out there. Outside the building, I think there's even more questions. We know how, how to deal with ergonomics in desks. But what happens when somebody goes to a coffee shop and they're sitting there working like this in the coffee shop? Uh, how do you include people that work remotely in your wellness programs? How do you keep them engaged? How do you make sure they have a best friend at work? What are all the things that we need to do to change the way we think about this whole area of work that's inclusive of these people that work remotely? And by the way, how do we get them to exercise? My own case, sitting too much caused me uh, um, tendon and hip pain that was so debilitating I couldn't go to the grocery store. I put on 15 pounds, 15 pounds. That led to depression. <laughs> um, and it took me two years of physical therapy to overcome that just from too much sitting. I'm telling you, it's, it's a killer. So just some closing thoughts. Uh, my fear is that we're more focused on rearranging the deck chairs uh, than we are on what it's actually doing to the, the people. Um, and you know, we're so focused on place that we're missing all this big stuff below the waterline, the people. And we've got to start coming around because they're expensive and they're the valuable assets. They're the performing assets, not buildings. Thank you. Terrifying, but at the same time, what an opportunity we have, right? How many of you in the audience right now are working with others in your organization that are tied to the well-being or the wellness um, strategies? Wonderful. A good, good strong. Need more hands, though. <laughs> yeah, we need more. So, Kate, I've got a question for you because I know you've been doing a lot of research and you've had to defend mobility programs and flex programs and things like that. And looking at this well-being component and having organizations really embrace them, what's the biggest challenge? The flex and the mobility or the well-being? What would be, what's the hardest one to get people on board with? I really think that well-being is the easier sell. Uh, wellness and well-being. The problem we have selling, I'm kind of a, a chameleon, you know, whatever it takes to sell. You know, the, the, the solution to the problem du jour. You've got problems with engagement, we can solve it with workspace, we can solve it with wellness. And right now I think this is driving it. Uh, you can see whether people are absent more. You can, you can do the numbers and know that if you can reduce presenteeism, and they have surveys that you know, you show whether there's a lot of presenteeism going on. You can measure these kinds of things. It's a lot easier than trying to, that holy grail productivity question that you know, somebody asked earlier. It's, it's, it's a very hard que question to answer, but this is very, very visible. Wonderful. Questions? What's the biggest challenge you have in getting towards a, developing a well-being program? the generational issues, the generation gap, uh, generational integration around uh, this topic? Uh, you've got to, I mean, it, it goes back to flexibility. You've got to have different kinds of programs. In fact, there's a backlash against some of the activity programs in companies now because, you know, some people just don't want to exercise, can't exercise, whatever. But one of the really interesting things I found in a number of studies is that it's not the baby boomers that are causing the increase in wellness costs and well-being. It's the multiple risk factors. It's, it's those having more than one, having two, having three, trumps age uh, across the spectrum. So you've just got to create the kinds of programs that engage internally and externally all of the, uh, the constituents. Mm -hmm. Good. Other questions? What are you finding to be some of the challenges for those of you that are developing a well-being program? Is it happening quickly? Is it 
Is it difficult, and if so, in what way? Well, part of it's participation, but I mean, mm. Um, my question or is, you know, the, our challenge is getting the employees to actually participate in the wellness programs we've invested in. And we have outside consultants that come in and they, they set up, we give them a great room, they have all their audiovisual support, they serve free food, they, you know, we try and entice our employees to come and attend these events and we'll get one or two or three people. And then I'll go around and rally people like, you know, come on, let's go to this thing, it's at three o'clock. Still, I don't know if people are too busy. It's just not a priority. They'd rather, I, I find most people want to be as efficient as possible during work hours so they can leave on time. Mm. So it's not a priority to do this kind of thing in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the same, same story as we have with agile work and remote work. It's got to come from the top. They've got to walk the walk, talk the talk. They've got to really lead you into this. Uh, you've got to have the champions. I mean, it's just, you, you could just like plug and play. It's the same conversation. There's also a big issue of privacy out there. Um, and uh, people, you know, the whole biometric screening, they just, employees, it's got to be anonymous. And even if it is, it's hard to get um, participation. But I've talked to companies that have 90% participation in their programs. Uh, it's taken them time. And the longer a program stays in place, the more effective it is, because they can kind of, they can help uh, overcome those obstacles. Great. Another question. Uh, Suzette Sparks. Uh, we deal with culture change uh, with our company. And one of the things we have found is data and information does not change behaviors. <laughs> so uh, in the last company we were in, for example, we shifted the cafe to uh, sustainable uh, farming, sustainable food, healthier food. Mm -hmm. We'd moved away, or, away from a grill mm -hmm. to um, healthier options. And we found that pe fewer people were using the cafe and chose to mm -hmm. leave to go out to eat because they wanted their burgers and their pizza and their mm -hmm. fries. They didn't want this lovely arugula salad. Um, they didn't care about the beets and the fresh fruit and vegetables. And that was a little surprising. We're based out of Seattle, and mm -hmm. we tend to be a little progressive a, mm -hmm. as a city. Yeah. And uh, that has been a big challenge yeah. uh, in terms of shifting individual mm -hmm. Did you do any training around the... Um, oh, yeah. We even involved uh, associates in the, in the selection of, of, um, the, food. of mm -hmm. the food of the vendor. So mm -hmm. it was hard to break that pattern because yeah. the cafe mm -hmm. before was a gri was a different mm -hmm. very different mm -hmm. so when we move people don't like and change work. and they certainly don't, don't like being forced they don't like being forced but even with all the information those patterns can be difficult yeah to break so well it's Thank time you. for lunch so let's give Kate <laughs> a really big round of applause Thank you.